So Arabic corpus was designed as a somewhat desperate attempt to overcome some of the challenges uh, facing Arabic corpus work. And I consider it a kind of stopgap measure that can help students and researchers until the time comes that someone is actually willing to invest the huge amount of resources and time it would take to create a large, lemmatized, uh, part of speech tagged corpus of Arabic. One of the reasons I'm actually giving this paper is just because I receive constant negative evaluations of Arabic corpus, which I completely agree with. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it's based on a misunderstanding of what Arabic corpus is trying to be. It's a stopgap measure um, more than anything else. Anyone who works with Arabic corpora can't help but develop a bad case of what I'm calling English corpus envy. Uh, for English, large, lemmatized, part of speech tad corpora are available, along with spectacular online tools that allow easy access to very advanced functions. There are also adequate tools for automatically lemmatizing and part of speech tagging in the first place, which facilitates the creation of these large corpora. So I want to quickly review these features while demonstrating some of the issues and challenges of dealing with non-limitized and non-part of speech tagged corpora that are peculiar to Arabic. By, by limitization, I mean the grouping of word forms that are meant to be or felt to be instances of the same underlying word uh, together for search and counting purposes. Uh, for example, grouping a noun with its plural or grouping the various forms of a verb. You can see I've done some for English there. And we saw uh, this morning in Latin that that was happening automatically. And that magic is not that easy to create, even for English. <laughs> um, while searching, when searching for forms in a non limitized English corpus, in many cases the forms you are searching for are right next to each other alphabetically. And even in cases when they aren't right next to each other, they're typically not very far away. Further, there are typically a fairly restricted number of word forms for the huge majority of words and limits, typically just two or three. So even if you had to list them separately in a search, it would not create a huge problem for the user. Arabic, on the other hand, has a number of features that make searching for forms in a non limitized uh, corpus problematic. Okay. First, every verb has a large number of forms when you count the past and present conjugations for every possible subject pronoun. So I've listed um, them here. I've written the forms in both Arabic scripts and then in a one-to-one -one transliteration so that non-Arabic speakers can get some idea of what I'm referring to. The forms you see um, for the verb form kataba, hold on a second, Let's see if I can get this. Whoop. So we have the, the the uh, past tense verbs there, the present tense verbs there, these extra forms for subjunctive adjustive and imperative here. Um, they, they, uh, some of the forms are the same, so I'm not counting those. Okay, I only count the forms that are graphically different. So if you count all the forms that are graphically different, different for a simple verb like kataba, you come up with 30 graphically distinct forms. Um, in the past tense, these forms do, uh, they alphabetize together, but obviously in the present tense they don't, because the present tense uses prefixes and not suffixes. Um, as if this were not enough, <laughs> most verbs can take a variety of extra prefixes and suffixes beyond those involved in the actual conjugation of the verb. These suffixes, the suffixes are mainly pronoun endings that represent the object of the verb. The prefixes include the future particle sa, the subordinating adjunction li, and the conjunctions fa and wa. The conjunctions can be attached to any form, while the other particles are limited to the present tense forms. But for those forms to take the particles, the particle can, um, for those forms that take the particles, the particle can also be combined with the conjunction. So let's, let's do a little math. We take all 30 forms that appear alone, and they can also appear with a wa or with a fa. That means you've got 90 possible word forms. Now, 13 of the imperfect forms can be combined with sa, and with wasa, and with fasa. So that adds 39 more forms. And 12 of them can be combined with li, wali, and fali, which is 36 more forms. So to find all the examples of this very simple verb, you need to examine 165 separate word forms, which are literally all over the alphabet. Then you need to realize that every one of these forms 
all 165 of them can be combined with 11 graphically distinct possible pronoun endings, giving a total of 1,815 possible word forms for every verb that you might want to look up. Um, <laughs> if you're thinking about searching for these and saying, you know, I want to know how many times this author is using the verb kataba in this novel. You're going to get a big headache, that's all I can say. <laughs> Nouns are going to be the same. They're not quite as bad. But if you just take any particular noun, it has the singular and it has the plural. That's two. But then it has four graphical forms of the dual. It, it's, when you think in computer terms, you don't, it's not the same. You think, oh, yeah, there's the singular, dual, and plural. That's three. No, there's the single, singular, kitab. Then there's kitabani, kitabaini. Kitaba and kitabai, because there's four possible graphical versions of it. So there's six forms of every noun in the simplest case. Okay, these can take attached prepositions. Okay, some of which don't allow for both of the dual forms, and so you get uh, it, it ends up with 18 possible forms. Um, you can add those to the conjunctions that we already talked about, fa and sa. And then you have to realize that almost all of those can appear with and without the article, and they can also appear with and without a pronoun ending. And so any noun in the language is going to appear in a corpus almost 400 in 400 different separate word forms. Okay, <clears throat> um, and these forms show up all over the alphabet. Another issue with Arabic is that it's written without short vowels. And so it's extremely common, for example, for any simple form one verb to have the verbal noun look exactly the same as the past tense key form. So for instance, darata means he applied pressure, and dalkt means pressure. Darasa means he studied, and dars means lesson. And they look the same. Graphically, they are the same. And so you have this, if we had a part of speech tagged corpus, that would all be figured out for you, but we don't, okay? <laughs> and so it's a problem. Some English corpora, many English corpora, like the British National Corpus, are very carefully constructed to include a balanced selection of a wide variety of genre. This allows one not only to find uh, uh, many examples of the use of a word, but also allows one to investigate whether or not the word is specialized or limited to particular genres, as opposed to being in more general use. This information is much harder to get from non-representative corpora, uh, like Arabic corpora are almost certain to be because of the difficulty and expense of creating a balanced corpus. English corpora have grown huge in the last decade. This makes it much more likely that you'll be able to find relevant examples of what you're looking for. <clears throat> and it also makes the lack of examples more meaningful. So for example, um, almost every textbook and all the verb books that talk about Arabic verbs give the, the one alternate form of the justice of doubled verbs. Those of you, you don't worry about it if you don't understand this, but you, you can say lam yamurra and lam yamurur. And they give them as just two alternatives. But you look in a, any of the small corpora that are available and you don't find lam yamurur. It just doesn't exist. But it's a small corpus, and so you're not sure. But if you get a 100 million word corpus or a you know, 300 million word corpus and you don't find any examples of lam yamur, then that is a meaningful thing. You say, oh, people just aren't using this particular version of the justice. A corpus by itself is just simply a, a collection of text and that's either coded up, lemmatized, POS tagged, etc., or simply left raw. Many corpora, both in English and Arabic, have been distributed in just that fashion, just as files. So if you if you Google Arabic corpora, you're going to get a bunch of corp corpora that you can download, but they're just files, and you have to figure out what to do with those files. You, it leaves to the user of, to find a way to search them. This is fine if the user happens to be very technically oriented, and I we heard about this in your talk this morning, but it creates a fairly high hurdle for the non-geeky, in which I include myself, okay? And in fact, it, which I include most students, teachers, and linguists, and humanities research in general, that, that you have a certain amount of technical skill, but you're not comfortable. And so you end up not choosing to use the tool or the corpus. Um, 
modern web interfaces like that available for the corpus of contemporary American English, uh, COCA, have made English corpora many, many times more accessible to the non-geeky. Uh, this is one of the actual motivations behind the creation of Arabic corpus, to provide a resource online with straightforward tools so something would be available for the huge majority of Arabic learners, teachers, and researchers who are uncomfortable kind of doing it by hand or doing it by themselves. Many of the English corpora are optimized for fast search, and we've heard about fast today. And it, it is almost miraculous. If you go to the Corpus of American English, uh, COCA, and it's, a, it's a, I think, up to 300 million words or something, and results come within two seconds. Mark Davies, who, he says he, he refuses to make anything where you can't get the results in, in two seconds. And so he, he does an amazing amount of pre-processing and uses huge amounts of data storage to be able to get that result. That's not something we yet have available in Arabic, so we sit around and wait, okay? <laughs> um, Arabic is blessed with what I call massive graphical ambiguity. Okay, <clears throat> this is partly caused by the not writing of short vowels, and I illustrated that e earlier. But even when you do write the short vowels, you, you have phonological ambiguity, maybe not quite as massive. I just give two short examples here. It's, it's, you think it's not a problem until you actually start working with it. And, and so, you know, there's certain words where you just cannot get what you want. You get too much of any other thing. And so this ta pa pa dal mean is a good example. You know, if you want to find the form one verb, hadima, or the form two verb, haddama, you're going to get a million form five verbs because takdimu, takdamu, and tukaddimu look exactly like takaddama, which is form five, and they don't mean anything like the same thing. Takdamu means she comes, form one present, tukaddimu, form two present. Tukdimu, form four present, but takaddama, form five past, and with a different, con you know, a different conjugation, third person masculine instead of feminine, and then takaddum is an imperative, takaddam is an imperative, and takaddum is a verbal noun. And they all look exactly the same. And this is not a little tiny problem, this is a massive problem in Arabic uh, online search, or any kind of <laughs> computer search. I, I love the next one, this ya ein dal. Ya ein dal is just the greatest word in Arabic because it can be so many things. It, it can be the jussive of ada ya'udu lam ya'ud. It can be the jussive of ada ya'adu lam ya'adu. It can be the jussive of ada yu'idu lam yu'id. Okay? It can be just the regular present tense of to count ya'uddu. It can be the passive of that, you ad do, which ends up meaning to be considered, and it can be a form for present tense, you do. And these are not, not similar in meaning at all. I mean, these are completely different words. You don't want to group them together. Okay. Um, in addition to that, um, for whatever reason, Arabs have decided that they are not going to be consistent in writing certain things. And so at the beginning, there's al the Hamza is written either on or under an aleph at the beginning of a word, and it is entirely optional. You can either put it or not put it. And if you do a study of it, which I have done, you find that it is always, it's not like one book always does it the same way. Whatever book you choose, whatever page you choose, one will have the Hamza and one will not. You know, it, it, it is completely random. And it's the same with the Aleph Maksura at the end. The Aleph, the, if you have a ya, here, let's get this thing. If you have a ya at the end of a word, sometimes it will be written without the two dots. But unfortunately, the Ahram and a few other sources in Egypt, when they have a word that's supposed to be written without the two dots, writes it with two dots. And so you have, it's absolutely, so we have, for instance, the word Ali, which is common name, and Allah, which is the preposition on. And it's absolutely random, which is going to be spelled like in the Ahram and in lots of other sources. And so you can't, if you want to find all the examples of Allah, you have to accept Ali, which seems stupid and ridiculous, but there it is. <laughs> okay. Another thing that makes this more difficult is that 
a lot of the prefixes and suffixes, if they were just, if they were very recognizable as just prefixes and suffixes, then you would just get rid of them. It would be easy. You would say, oh, Aleph Lamb, Al, that's the definite article. We'll take all the Aleph Lambs off the words, and then we'll be left with the word. No, because there's all kinds of words that have Aleph Lamb, but it's part of the word. And so I, I, you have to read Arabic to get this, but I give the example of Iltiham, which starts with an Aleph Lamb, and to prove that it's part of the word, you can add an Aleph Lamb to it and say Al Iltiham. The same with a lot of uh, pronoun endings. For instance, home is there, like kitab home is their book, but you can get a word like ittaham, which ends in what looks like home. And of course, you can say ittaham home. <laughs> you can have home home. And the, the last one there is the same nabbaha, nabbahahu. And B at the front of a word, you think, oh, I'm going to take all the Bs off the word. That means in. And, but you can't do that because there's all kinds of words that end with B that start with B, even words with four letters. So like bulbul, B bulbul, it's tough. That's, I think the whole point of that is just to say that there, it's extremely frustrating if you are given a large amount of Arabic text and you're just using a search function. You go into BB Edit or any other normal thing with a really strong search function and just start searching. You get tons of stuff that you don't want. And you don't get all of what you want. And that's the, that's the whole point of, of these kind of corpora, is to get what you want and not what you don't want. <laughs> those, two, those are the two keys. And it just doesn't work for Arabic. You, you, the first thing I did in the digital humanities was a synonym dictionary. And I was supposed to find you know, kind of core examples of all the words that I was using to, to really show how this synonym was a little bit different from that synonym. And before I really understood how to use corpora, I thought, well, that's going to be really fun. I have to read through a year's worth of newspapers 75 times to be able to get these examples. And then I figured out I could start searching for them. But as I started searching and developing search tools, I just would get so frustrated because you would get 400 examples, and only three of them would be examples of the thing you were searching for. Everything else would be garbage. It, it, it really is not. It's, it's not straightforward, that's all I'm going to say. Okay, so Arabic has many other features, like multiple broken plurals, non-sound verbs, which make it difficult to gather the forms for a particular word. I mean, the one I love the most is, is the verb bana. You know, bana is to build, and, and if you search for bana and all the possible morphological forms of bana, 90% of the words you get have nothing to do with to build. For, you get bent, for example, instead of bana. Bent is girl <laughs> instead of she built, and it, et cetera. You know, <clears throat> bunai, for example, is my son. Yeah, bunai, and that has nothing to do with build. It just goes on and on, OK? So right now, I just want to give you an introduction to Arabic corpus, and at the same time, kind of inter introducing how you know, first of all, just recognizing that it, this was developed by me, a non-techie person, without resources. I was not giving, I've never gotten a grant for this, and I've never gotten help from a computer professional. And so I make no claims for it, <laughs> I mean, as far as it being a professional product. Um, I was just trying to take what I knew how to do and make it available literally as a rebuke to the computer professionals who should be doing this. This is meant as a rebuke. They don't take it as a rebuke. They just criticize it. <laughs> there are large Arabic corpora, corpora out there that are so techy, you, no one will use them except, except you know, computer professionals. There's Arabic GigaWord, for example. There's Call Home Arabic. There's all kinds of things out there that 99.9% .9 of students and teachers refuse to use because they can't figure out how to do it. Okay? This tool that is incredibly non-geeky and that has millions of problems that they immediately point out has 10,000 users, that have, all of whom have used it at least 10 times and hundreds of users who have used it over a hundred times. I mean, it just says something. You were talking about this this morning. You have to make something that is simple enough and not scary 
Uh, and as soon as you do that, people love it. I mean, they want it. They need it. But the tools have always been there. And they could have used them. <laughs> they just weren't willing to until it, until it got into a web interface. So anyway, I wanted to try to ameliorate some of the problems inherent in a raw corpus. There was no question that this was going to be a raw corpus. I didn't have the resources to even consider not making it a raw corpus. It turns out there are automatic POS tagging and limitization tools out there for Arabic. I spent years working with them. Don't tell anybody this, but they're crappy. <laughs> they don't work, okay? They work great if you're a computer science professional and you're doing it for a professional paper that you're giving at a computer science conference and you're demonstrating that it has 65% accuracy and blah, blah, blah. But if you're doing it to try to find the words, no. They just don't work. It, it, it's, not, it's not useful. We, don't, we just simply are not, are not there yet. Okay. This is something, I actually am surprised that someone else said this today. <laughs> but but this, this is the most important decision I made. Okay, I decided I need to put the corpus on a server and provide access to it through a web-based program. Okay, it seems like a no-brainer in hindsight, but it was not obvious to me at the time. And it's so hard to remember, for those of you who aren't old like me, <laughs> that when computers weren't so ubiquitous and when the internet was not just a foregone conclusion, we forget how fast things have changed. Okay. I spent several years with this corpus and building this corpus, and I used Perl on the command line to search it. And it was great. That's how I did my synonym dictionary. It worked wonderfully. But I thought I was so excited about it, I started telling my students and my colleagues about it. And I was willing to send them the files. I mean, you couldn't send them in those days. You had to hand them to them on a zip drive or something and give them the program so they could do it themselves. I had zero takers. No one was willing to do it. It just was too complicated, even though it wasn't really complicated. I could explain how useful it was, but it didn't matter. As soon as I put it online, the exact opposite thing happened. Everyone was willing to give it a try. And instead of me having to offer, people sought the program out. Okay, um, It became popular. There's about a hundred references on uh, Google Scholar of people that have used it for dissertations, for books, and for scholarly articles. People needed a corpus, <laughs> but they needed one that they could use. Uh, when I look through my usage, I have about 10 users who have thousands of searches each. And most of them, I know who they are, and they're all working on dictionaries. You know, and, and that's funny because I know some of these people and they're very, very sophisticated corpus linguists and they know how to use Sketch Engine and they themselves have huge corpora that they can search. But sometimes it's just easier to go to Arabic corpus and find it there. I mean, it's, that, that, that's the point is that it's the ease of use that makes the difference, okay? Um, people who are afraid of, pro of programming are not afraid of a browser. Nobody is afraid of a browser these days. And I think that's a really key point. OK, I'm just going to run through uh, what you do in Arabic corpus. In Arabic corpus, you have to choose a part of speech. And I'm going to go into that in a minute to explain why that's important. But you choose a part of speech. You tell the computer what you're looking for. And that helps the computer narrow down the range of things that it will find for you. Then you choose a corpus. Um, you can choose all, but that gives you a long wait. This is about a 150 million word corpus. It's large. It's not large in terms of modern American corpora, but it's large in terms of Arabic corpora. And it, it, it's a raw text corpora, so it takes quite a while. And a lot of the things that you might want to find out, you can find out in one newspaper. And so what I've done is all the newspapers I have, I've divided them into years. It's about a year's worth of newspaper. And that's a very intuitive for a lot of users. Because it's, it's, it's like saying, if I read the Ahram for a year, I'm going to see this word 62 times. That's about once a week. Or I'm going to see this word you know, 723 times, which is about twice a day. It gives you an idea, a, a, a palpable feeling you know, for, for the frequency of that, of that word. 
um, this also kind of shows you a pathetic attempt to balance this corpus. Okay, I wanted to have some kind of balance. And so I, but literature was not much available. And so I started digitizing it, but hand digitizing, even with modern tools, is, is both expensive and uh, fraught in various ways. I finally got a million words. And so I have one million words of literature out of 150 million words. And so that's not balance, but at least it allows you to look at the literature separately. Okay, I have some nonfiction. I have Islamic discourse that comes out of Islamic websites. And that can be useful for some people, a little bit of colloquial, and a bunch of pre-modern stuff that various people have given me, and the Arabic learner corpus that um, somebody else did and begged me to put it on, on here. I can actually put anything on that anybody wants me to. If, if anybody hands me you know, a file that's in Unicode, I, I'm usually willing to put it on if it's a fairly major piece of Arabic. Um, but I can't, I'm not willing to digitize it myself. You can either type the thing you're looking for in Arabic or in, Engl or in transliteration. Notice that you, you type the verb in its dictionary form, in this case, taraha, or in transliteration, taraha. There's a transliteration table available. Once you run it, it gives you uh, a little bit of quantitative information. And so, for instance, here, I ran it through the modern literature corpus. You can see right there, it tells you what you ran it through. It, it went very fast in this case. It found 101 examples of this verb. And then it gives you, it does the math for you and tells you how many instances per 100,000 words. If you want to know the instances per million words, you know what to do. <laughs> Add a zero. But that, that gives you, for every single word you look up, you get this quantitative information. It turns out to be really helpful and pretty insightful. Uh, for a lot of at least lexicographic and pedagogical uses. Then you go to the citations page. You can see here that you can click on any of these ways of looking at the data. And so if you go to the citations page, this is a typical concordance. It gives you the 10 words before and the 10 words after, and it sorts by the word before. So you can see the word before is right here, but it also puts it here. So you can look down quickly and, and it does that 100 words at a time, basically. I'm only, only showing you a little bit of the page. But that uh, allows you to, to case out the word and how it's being used. You can also click here uh, where it says sort by word after. So then instead of sorting by the word before, it'll sort by the word after. And that'll, it allows you kind of to look through and, and check for what words go with this particular word uh, commonly. In an attempt to... Try, to help with, with uh, kind of understanding what a balanced corpus would give you, not being able to provide a balanced corpus, I actually provide the piece of literature that the works come from. And so this is just names of pieces of literature where these words were used. And so you can see actually there's some pieces of literature where it's very common for whatever reason and others not. In the case of newspapers, newspapers are all downloaded from websites. And the websites almost always include sections in the actual URL. And so I can pull out those sections and organize the pieces of the newspaper. And so this means that the subsections are going to be different from every single, in every single newspaper, but they're still relatively helpful. Because every newspaper is going to have front page articles, Arab news articles, sports. You know, basic categories are going to be more or less the same. And so you can kind of, you, you'll be able to look down here and see, oh, this one seems to be used pretty broadly about the same through all subsections, whereas another word, like if you look up the word haddis, which is guard, you know, it turns out that you find that mainly in sports because it's the guard of a soccer, you know, the, the goalie. Uh, and that's, to me, to me, that's important somehow. You know, in other words, for a student to, to, to just learn the word haddis means guard, but to also be able to tell the student, if you're going to be reading the newspaper every day, 98% of the time you see this word, it's going to be in a sports article. It's going to mean goalie. That's relatively useful information. Okay. Then you can click on word forms. Okay. And what it does is it gives you, oh, that is not word form. There we go, word form. Unfortunately, I put the wrong slide in here for word forms. So it doesn't <laughs> show you something else. But what it does is it shows you every example 
every possible word that it found in its form. And so if, if it was kitab, it would have kitab, al-kitab, bil-kitab, kitabuhu, kitabuha. It would show you everything it found. And it would show you how many of them it found. And you can click on one of them and see only the citations for that one. Here is the words before and after. This is just a compilation of the same way I sorted uh, the, uh, the citations, OK? And so you can see we're looking at the word taraha, OK, the verb taraha. And the word after, the most common word after is alaihi, then alaika, then ala. And then we have asila, sual, al asila. Again, just that information right there is pretty helpful for students, you know, to realize when I see taraha, I'm probably going to see something about question. <laughs> You know, taraha and question go together because it means to pose a question. And to someone, that's what the Allah comes from. There's just something satisfying about this kind of information. Finally, I, I, this is actually something I added later after a lot of complaints. You know, Arabic has fairly free word order, not totally free word order. And so not all the colicus are going to be right before and right after. And I was letting people look at the words right before and letting them look at the words right after. But normally in a corpus, they, a collocation, is, you, you set a range. And you say within four words on the front and within four words on the end. And so I just did that so people could have it. And so this says within four words on one side and four words on the other side, what are the most common words and, and that go with this word? And again, you see that Allah and as illa show up at the top, and then come su'al, and a whole bunch of other alas as we go farther down. And it also allows you to download all the citations that you can then bring into an Excel file. And with it basically has one column with the 10 words after, one column with the word, and one column with 10 words before. And then you can sort those in various ways, count them, do whatever you want with them outside of the program. OK, so that was kind of a, a very quick introduction. Now I just want to go back to some of the aspects and, and talk about why I made those choices. So computers, as we know, are very good at searching for exact strings. But they're not good at understanding what humans just do intuitively and figuring out, oh, that's an example of that word. And that is not an example of that word because of this context. Um, at least computers being manipulated by non-geeky people like me are completely incapable of doing that. OK, when you search for exact strings in Arabic, uh, you typically generate so many false hits that the results seem useless. And so the reason I came up with the idea of, this, of the user choosing the part of speech is because that allows the program to reduce the number of false hits. OK, so when what happens, the, the whole way this program works is you type in any, any set of, of uh, any sequence of letters. And the computer instantly finds every example of that string of letters. For instance, if you search for, a, for the string DRS, darasa, you will get basically thousands of hits. Uh, and these are all different. <laughs> You know, you get more than thousands if you count the, each individual one. But the idea is you have three categories. One category is that string with a whole bunch of extra letters around it, just different words. And you're definitely not searching for those. Those are different words. I'm not looking for madrasa. I'm not looking for madaris. I'm not looking for, you know, landerstorman, which is a Finnish name. I mean, <laughs> that happens to have DRS in it, you know. And so, because I cho if I choose string, it's just going to give me every example of DRS. But if I choose noun, it's going to know that there's only some things that are possible with noun. It can have the definite article. It can have any of those prep prepositions that can be on the front. It can have a pronoun ending, or it can be plain. But it can't have a meme on the front. And so it immediately cuts out all those things. If the other two categories of things it chooses is things that have to be a noun or that have to be a verb. So if you have DRS with an aleph lamb on the front, the article, it is a noun. Okay? If you have DRS with a 
cath on the front. Okay, that means like. It has to be a noun. But if you have DRS with a yeah on the front, that's a verb conjugation. It has to be a verb. Okay, and so the second category of, of things that it finds when it finds DRS is all these things that are unambiguously one or the other. And so by choosing noun, I cut out all the verb ones. And by choosing verb, I cut out all the noun ones. And that winnows down the false hits enough that then I'm willing to deal with the results. Okay? The third category of things that it will find are things that are absolutely, totally ambiguous. Okay? That's like the bare form. The bare form can be darasa, a verb, or daras, a noun. And there's nothing you can do about that. And that's another complaint I get constantly with Arabic corpus. Is that I chose a noun, and it gave me a verb. And I'm saying, <laughs> you didn't read the instructions. <laughs> I didn't promise you that, I, that it would find only nouns, or that it would find only verbs. I promised you that the thing that it finds, totally out of context, could be that noun. Morphologically, graphically, it could be a noun. Or it could be a verb. Who knows? And so, so basically what the part of speech does is it, it hugely reduces the number of hits. You can see this is still searching for the exact same thing, but I've chosen noun. Okay? And here, here we have all sorts of nouns. Whoops. So there's a darsh, which has to be a noun, but there's the bare form, which could be a verb. There is darsan, and you would also say, oh, that has to be a noun. No. Because it could be darasa, it could be the dual. Here's wad darasa or wad dars, ambiguous. Here's wad dars, not ambiguous. Here's darsuna, that could be ambiguous, could be kadarasna. And so, you know, in other words, you have to go through on your own and decide, you know, whether it's ambiguous or not. But, but the point is, a good number of these are not ambiguous. Enough so that you could deal, deal with it as a researcher, instead of just throwing up your hands and saying, I'm not doing this, I'm not playing this game, okay? Um, so this is just an example of, of the verbs. Of course, in, in the verb section, you get a lot more uh, forms, because verbs are just so copious in the number of forms, but maybe less of them are ambiguous. The first one here is ambiguous, but then the second one is not, the third one is not, this one is, etc. Go, going on. Okay. Here's an example of the word form list, finally. Uh, the reason I give the, words form, the words, word form list is so researchers and students, using their knowledge of Arabic, can get some kind of an idea about whether the numbers that this is providing should even be paid attention to. So you come to the word form list and say, how many of these hits are ambiguous? And you can just kind of go down and look at the word forms that it finds. And if you say, oh, half of them are ambiguous, these numbers are not going to tell me much. I have to actually look through the ambiguous ones and see before I can trust these numbers. And so this is, this is just kind of a way of dealing with this idea that I'm, I'm, I don't have a POS tag corpus, I do not have a lemmatized corpus, but I have something that can get me a handle on that. Okay? Um, now, there are ways that Arabic corpus provides to help you do a little bit better than that. But to do that, you have to get a little bit geeky, okay? And so, <laughs> so this is something that I don't advertise too much, but it's in the instructions. And when people call me or email me, how, how can I do this, I tell them. If you are willing to learn regular expressions, regular expressions is something that is in Perl, it's in Unix, it's in most computer languages. And they're not hard, but they're a little tricky. I mean, you have to, there's a little bit of learning curve there, but if you are willing to use regular expressions, I allow you to type in a form, then a space and a dash and a space. And then you type in anything in the regular expression format that you want to cut out. Okay? And so, for example, here, my main offender here is these two words here. And so if I want to, if I want to investigate Darsh as a noun, I want to get rid of those. <laughs> and so I would just say, I don't want any form that starts with a D. <laughs> I only, and maybe I just want, and that'll basically give me present tense verbs or, or whatever. I, I still am looking for nouns, so it'll give me the ones with aleph lamb, it'll give me the ones with a preposition, but it's not going to give me any of these potentially, potentially uh, 
ambiguous ones, and that will cut out all those and make it just easier to deal with. This is an example of regular expressions. Regular expressions are not difficult, but there's, I typed in DRS, okay, and I put the dash. Backslash B means word break. So, so this means I'm, I'm trying to cut out just the this, this simple form DRS. And it, if you can read Arabic, you can see that, in fact, it doesn't show up. It, it disappeared there. Um, the reason I allow for typing and transliteration is for the regular expressions. When you type regular expressions in Arabic, it just looks so bizarre. I mean, really, really bizarre. And so it works, actually. But most people just throw up their hands. So I let you, I, it's just easier to do regular expressions with Latin letters. Um, another possible strategy is looking through that w list. So we can look here and say, OK, um, you know, these forms over here, like a darsein, darsehi, not real common. Statistically, they're not going to make much difference, unless I happen to be investigating dual or something like that. But look at this form here. I mean, you know, that, that's like about half of all the forms is in that one form. And so say I'm comparing this word to some other word. If I said, well, I'm just going to look at that form. I'm only going to look at this word with a definite article. Then I know I have the noun. I know I have a very common form that statistically is going to be consistent. And if I compare the same thing with the other noun, then I can be pretty sure, you know, point oh whatever, <laughs> that, that those statistics are going to match the statistics of the overall form, which I can't get without actually reading through the thousand forms. I'm not willing to read through the thousand forms, so I'm willing to use the stand-in, ad-dars, for the whole entire noun dars. And it, that turns out quite a few people use that technique. Okay? You do the same thing with verbs. You say there's all these ambiguous, remember, tukhaddam? Tukhaddama, ya tukhaddamu, tukhaddimu, tukhaddimu, tukhaddamu, and you go, oh, I can never ever find any information about this form. But if you use ya tukhaddam as a stand-in form, then that reduces the ambiguity by maybe, you know, 90%. So, so you find a standing form, one that's very common, but is also unambiguous, and then use that as your comparison. And, and you get not all the way there, but part of the way there. There's an example of stand-in forms. I just gave you the example of just looking for ad-dars, wad-dars, and fad-dars. That's the only things it's finding, and then comparing it to al-ibra, fal-ibra, and wal-ibra. And that would give you a, an idea of the relative frequency where you know, the lesson is showing up in this particular citation. It's one year of a Jordanian newspaper, almost 600 times, whereas al-ibra, which also means the lesson in a slightly different context, is more like 200 times. So that gives you a feel for the frequency of those two words. To address corpus size and search time, I think I mentioned this before, I, I basically just allowed people to search parts of the corpus at once. So if, you're, if, if a time is a factor, you search one part of the corpus. If you're willing to wait three minutes, then you search the whole corpus if you want that data for whatever reason. Um, the same thing kind of applies to the balancing. Although the corpus itself is not balanced, you can hand balance by, by choosing to, by saying sort, look for only one newspaper and for certain literary features and through the Islamic text or whatever. You can, you can, you can search. Part, different parts of the corpus that therefore would be balanced in your own way. Um, another fairly common technique that, that people have used and that I've used quite a bit is to count a sample. And so, for example, in looking for word senses for my dictionary, I, I have a word and it has three senses. And I want to be able to tell the person using the dictionary which sense is most common, what, what is the relative frequency. But there's you know, 2,000 examples, even in a single year of a newspaper. And so what I do is I download those samples and use a, a program that I wrote that's very fast that chooses 50 randomly. It just, it just picks out 50 and throws them in a thing. I'm willing to read 50. And so I go through those 50 and code them and, and get this, uh, you know, the, the actual relative percentages of the three word senses. And, and then when I stick it in the dictionary, I make it very clear in the introduction, if anyone's willing to read it, most of them aren't, that these percentages are not any truth about the world. <laughs> They're just that sample. But that sample is better than nothing. And it usually 
rings true somehow. In other words, you, you look at the sample and you go, yeah, I can, I can feel that that one is probably going to be a lot more common and that one less common. And so for, this is an example of, of, of my current dictionary project. I have the word majlis. Majlis can mean council or it can just be a seat, a chair you're sitting on, or a gathering. Okay? And you can see that I have 36, 36, and 27. It turns out that in, in the particular corpus I was using, which is the literature corpus, um, they were about a third each. Each of them were fairly common. And that's, you would not, I promise you, get that idea if you looked this up in a regular dictionary. You would not realize that, that majlis was actually pretty common to mean party, <laughs> get together, you know, something like that. So I just wanted to show you a few kind of actual usages. So here is a search for majlis and looking through the words before and the words after to get a feel for the different word senses. And so here we get majlis as shab, okay, majlis as ta'awun, majlis as mum, which all have to do with, you know, some kind of a council. Um, but bidek, <laughs> only the Arabic speakers are going to understand this, but, you know, there's something about laughter. You know, and you look up the examples of this and you realize this is the party one, you know, that the whole majlis erupted in laughter, okay. And so it, it allows you to quickly hone in on specific word senses if you're looking for examples of something without having to read through hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, things. Uh, here's another this example I like to use a lot. Wilaya, you know, we teach that to students as meaning state, as in Wilaya, California. And uh, if you look it up in VAR or even on Google Translate, it doesn't even manage to tell you that it means term in office which turns out to be very common, and they don't very often mention the, uh, the meaning that is used in the kind of Islamic sense uh, of a certain kind of rule. But it turns out that in this particular, uh, in Al-Haya, the particular year, 1997, Wilayat al-Saqih, which refers to Iranian rule of mullahs, you know, is the most common usage. Then we have Wilayat California, but the next most common one is Thania, Al-Wilaya Thania which can only mean term in office, you know, the, the second term in office. I, I know those of you who don't speak Arabic are saying, what the fuck is I should stop doing this, but, it, but it's, it's, it's just fairly revealing. It's a, you're able to kind of get at word senses quite easily with this. We lay at the the term of the president, etc. cetera. Um, also, you look down here and you find that you get California, Texas, um, Florida, New York, but you don't get any provinces of Egypt, and you don't get any provinces of Lebanon. And so we teach students that we lay them in state, but we often neglect to tell them that it has nothing to do with any kind of, you know, you know division in most Arab countries. <laughs> We're talking about Florida and California. <laughs> okay. Um, and then one of the common features, or one of the common words that came before Wilaya was Akbar, and I thought Akbar. Why would people be Akbar means biggest? I, I I couldn't figure out why people would so commonly say the biggest state, it, and so I looked it up. You can always click on it to see what the what the uh, citations are, and of course it turns out that's the name of somebody. You know, he, it, it's Ali Akbar Wilayati, or probably Wilayati, because I think he's a Persian mullah or something. And so it, it's just useful. It, it, it allows you quick access to find something that you're having a question about and then dismiss it if it turns out that it's a nothing, okay? It's, it's um, very interesting. You, you, you can find creative ways of using this corpus to get at grammatical variability. And so, for example, at one point I decided to look up tajib. Yajib is, it is necessary, it's commonly <clears throat> what we might call, it, it doesn't necessarily agree with the noun it goes with. The noun it goes with is usually a sentence. But every once in a while, you do get tajib. It's variable, OK? Tajib is conjugated for, for she instead of for he, OK? And so this allowed me to find all the tajib citations in a particular uh, newspaper and then look at what was what the most common Citations. I wanted to be able to compare um, to really get some kind of handle on what was more common, yajib or tajib. And so first of all, I looked up uh, 
tajib and found out that the most common feminine verbal noun that went with it was muraja, and the next most common was ishara. Tajib al ishara al something. Okay, so I decided, well, that's what I'm going to compare. So I got the, the statistics for tajib al ishara and for yajib al ishara, so I could compare them and to see you know, which one is more common. And you can see it's not very hard to figure out that yajib al ishara is quite a bit more common, but still the other one does exist. Okay. Um, another, if you're willing to use regular expressions, you can also expand that a little bit. Here I took the top eight feminine verbal nouns and put them all in a, in a regular expression, so it's searching for all of them at once. Okay, so I have um, ishara, mu'alaja, munakasha, muraja, mura'a, mu'akaba, and muhasaba, which were the most common feminine verbal nouns that might go with hajibu or yajibu. And then you could, and so that gave me a, a better feel. I, and and, and al-ghad, I got 19 of the feminine agreement and 53 of the masculine. So that gives me, you know, a fairly secure statistic. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than nothing. And I, I think that's kind of the point that I'm making in this whole paper. Here is another <clears throat> kind of research project I did at one point, just looking for the future particle, sa or salfa. You, you can have the long form salfa or the short form sa. I use the regular expression to search for them both at once. And, and the, the results are really pretty interesting. If you look at, at al-haya for a year, the most common forms are sa yakun. I, oh, no, I, I chose the form yakun because there's too many sas that mean something other besides this. And so I just so, chose yakun and takun. Okay, and look, there's sayakun, satakun, wasayakun, wasatakun, sa all the sas are first. They're the most common. And then all the salfas are second. Whereas in al ahram okay, they're mixed up. There's a lot of sas, but there's a lot of salfas too. Okay, Egyptians really do use salfa a lot more than people in the Levant. I've got, you know, a ton of evidence for that. Um, it's... This is a really good place to find rare forms, okay? So I, I actually found a couple of yamurors, for example, <laughs> finally, after, after years of searching, okay? And it's also really great for finding idiomatic expressions. My students were reading a newspaper article, and it says, well, have a marbatal plus. And being a non-native speaker, I'd never seen that before. It means, and that's where you tie up the horse. I mean, I understood it, but I didn't understand it, you know. <laughs> but, I, but I looked up marabat here, and look, I mean, it's just so interesting that this is, it's just such a window on the thing. Marabat al-faras, marabat al-na'ama, that's the ostrich, that's where you tie up the ostrich. Marabat al khail this is a way to find out all the different words that mean a horse in Arabic. Khailun, <laughs> you know. In, in other words, it just, all of a sudden, you get this feel, and also the, the frequency you know, in one year, oh, well, this is all newspapers, but still, you know, 134 of that idiom. You say, oh, this is an idiom I want to learn. It's, it's motivating. The conclusion, I, I think, is just that with a certain amount of creativity and patience, you know, you can get a lot of good out of fairly simple, non-sophisticated tools. I would love if someone had the resources, Potar maybe, or <laughs> someone who's willing to put in $10 million dollars and get an army of coders and code up, POS tag, lemmatize, and really get us, you know, a hundred million word corpus that is balanced and works. But until that time, I'm hoping that Arabic corpus will help a lot of people get a handle on Arabic. Thank you. Thank you.